do my work over in CTRL as the Senior Quantitative and Computational Research Methodologist. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And I'm thrilled to chat with you all about uh, Python, specifically within Jupyter Notebook for teaching quantitative methods. So I'm trained as an experimental psychologist. My research is more focused on the um, on educational psychology, more specific to psychometrics, statistical simulation, and all of that. Um, the recording. A uh, great question about the recording. I believe that'll be on YouTube. It will be available on the the C T L website probably I think two weeks afterwards. Um, feel free to reach out to me afterwards, and I'll make sure I find it for you and send it over to you. Great. Um, so here today we're going to talk a little bit about well, how to go about teaching uh, research methods, specifically using uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Python, because uh, it can be really challenging at times for new users. So, and especially using any sort of syntactical language, whether it be R, Python, Stata, SAS, and so forth. So let me go ahead and start this up. So I usually don't use slide decks, but I figured let me give this a try. Let me go ahead and move this out of the way. <coughs> uh, so by the end of the session, will you be able to identify potential solutions to common challenges that are faced by students using Jupyter Notebooks? Explain the benefits and limitations of this, because there's no perfect system, so there's always going to be limitations. So I want to have that be fully transparent. And we're going to describe how to set up teaching example and homework assignment in Jupyter Notebooks. This is how I would do it. But feel free to take this, adapt it, modify it, see what works for you in your specific class. Um, I am by no means saying that this is the only way to do this. This is just what I found to be effective. So some common issues with teaching quantitative methods. It's students have information overload, to be honest with you. A lot of them will, a lot of students will take quantitative methods at, towards the end of their time, if at all possible. I know in undergrad, I was one of those who I waited till the last moment to have to take quantitative methods because it was scary for me. I was scared of statistics. Uh, things change where I now love it. But it's it's it can be intimidating. Um, a lot of students say that they're maybe no good at statistics or at math. So a lot of it's trying to get over that mindset as well as trying to learn the content and learn a computer program on top of that. So that is a lot of complexity. So try to make it as uh, manageable as possible. So that's my big recommendation is kind of break it down. And there's also issues with installing the software. Uh, it might be easy for Windows users, but what if they're using Linux or a Chromebook or Mac? Each of those had their own different ways of doing it. And you as an instructor have to be able to have provide recommendations on like how to go about doing this if they run into issues. And that's a lot of information. There's also the cost. A lot of proprietary software can cost easily from $50 a semester to a couple hundred. So like things like Stata, there's discounts for student licenses. SPSS has some licenses. And SAS, it's expensive, but it can be really costly. And so paying on top of the course, now they have to buy a copy of their own license for the software as well. And this will bypass issues of like, let's say they're trying to use Stata on the virtual application and desktop system. Great system, but it might be problematic for some users. And also trying to access the software after leaving AU. I'm a big proponent of open software, a little bit of a spoiler. Um, when I left graduate school, I didn't have access to SAS or SPSS. I couldn't afford licenses of these, my postdoc salary. So I just, I committed to R fully. And I haven't really looked back since. I still use the software in my day-to-day -day and for consultations. But being able to access the software upon leaving an institution and be able to hone your skill sets. And because if it's like a, I think a quantity method is like a muscle. If you stop using it, you're not going to improve. So being able to have access to the software to continue to refine your skills for data analytics is going to be so critical. And a lot of times, too, there's questions of, well, who on campus provides support and for troubleshooting it? Um, c 2 we don't provide uh, student support for for software, for the statistical software. So if you're teaching with a specific software, you need to be able to help provide support and troubleshooting in your class. So I would be a proponent of open source. Um, it's free to use now and forever. So you don't have to pay, or students don't have to pay on top of the course. They can continue using it or using it after leaving AU. And there's actually a growing demand. 
I know uh, R, Python, you see it a lot of different job applications and job postings. Uh, in some disciplines, commercial software is no longer the norm, at least in psychology. You'll still see some SPSS here and there, but it's mostly R, at least within my experiences. <laughs> the next thing, too, is it open source develops quicker compared to commercial software. I'm sure, there's not as much support, but there's communities of support instead. So if I'm having a hard time trying to figure out how to run a specific latent variable analysis within R or within Python, I can jump on the forums and get my and get help on these. And sometimes it's just talking with the developers too. The nice thing too is if you learn one syntax language, you can learn others quite easily. Um, when I was first at AU, I knew R, I knew some Python, I didn't know Stata, but I, with what I do from syntax language, seeing the syntax, I can break it down quickly and learn a different language. And also the idea with equity for this. Open source, it's equitable. You're going to be able to have access to it. You're not going to have to worry about paying for it. And that, that's a big proponent for me. Um, so if you're interested, I also have a link in here to a B article that I wrote last year. Let me go ahead and move this over. And this is focused on R, but you can do the same thing with Python. and kind of really breaks down why I think it's really important to move to open source for teaching. Also, it's giving students another tool for their tool belt. <laughs> so Jupyter Notebook is really, it's a great starting point. Um, if you're doing really complex analysis, really complex code, like think about the high-performance computer. It can run on a high-performance computer, but it's I'd recommend other ways of doing the Python scripts. But for teaching, it is a phenomenal tool. Uh, the nice thing is it can run on a Chromebook. It's a little complicated to get it up and running, but it is quite possible to install on it. You can install it on a tablet. I don't recommend this, but you can. Um, I know I was able to install like on a little Surface had um, R and Python, so it was not a big problem. It's just you start running out of space eventually. Uh, but it's definitely possible. The nice thing with Jupyter Notebooks too is you can annotate the code. So I really like this for teaching demonstrations, for homework, is that you have the code, your results, and annotations all within one file. The nice thing with Jupyter is you can also combine codes, markdowns, links, images, all within a document. It supports multiple languages, not just Python. And you can actually use this to develop a portfolio. So I always recommend for any assignments, have a purpose for it. Have it with the intent of the students either going to be submitting for a manuscript if they're a grad student, or start developing a portfolio of like the, the skill set that they have. And I always would recommend at the start of a class, like start building that portfolio so you can highlight your skills that you've learned. You can also break down code line by line rather than an entire script. That's why I love Jupyter Notebooks. <laughs> now, that being said, there's limitations. And we'll want to open up Jupyter Notebook in a little bit, and we'll talk through it. It's a web-based IDE, which it's going to be a limitation with it. You're also limited to one CPU a lot of times. You have to save and access it via browser. And if you start jumping around the different cells, you can create issues for yourself. So you need to want to kind of keep it linear, keep it in the same order, because if you start jumping around then it might be out of sequence and you're going to get some weird stuff happen and people aren't going to be able to replicate it. There is a learning curve though. Syntactics languages, they take a little bit longer to learn, but there's a benefit because you it really forces you to understand the data and understand the language, what's doing rather than a point and click option. Uh, there's also some version control issues like using Git, but we're not going to talk about too much with Git though. So really some things to consider though, and this is kind of with any sort of software, whether this be R or Python. So if you go into the R1 later on this afternoon, you'll see kind of the same slide deck because it's the same information. But to be more specific to R, though, the big thing <laughs> is where the files are saved. A lot of students that I've worked with and that I've, I've taught, they put everything in the downloads folder. And that's okay. I did the same thing when I was first getting started. But sometimes like the, having to change directories know where files are and keep track of them, it can be burdensome. So try to fit kind of, I'd always recommend starting with where the files are located 
and actually create a bin. So each assignment, each activity, everything has its own bin or folder. That way it's all dumped in there and they can go and change things around quickly. Uh, there's some update errors I always recommend doing, but also please, please, please make sure your students name each notebook. Uh, the default is not named. So when they try to open it up, that can be problematic. So always have like a bin for each one. Now, some strategies I like to use when I teach with open source languages is mentioning the benefit early on. So mentioning, well, why are we focusing on a syntactic language rather than like a point and click option? And what's the benefit of this? How is this going to be advantageous after you leave the course, after you leave the university? And that helps with buy-in as well. Because if they see the logic, why, why am I doing this? Why am I learning a whole new language? It's going to take me longer. Then it's it's really kind of developing that skill. And it's going to be setting them up for success later on. I'd also focus on file location. So what I like to do is I, I open up the software. I show them how I install everything. And then I download stuff. And I go through mainly and show like, okay, well, this is my downloads folder. So I need to move this over and kind of walk them through that and do recordings of this. Because sometimes when you're first getting started with a course, it's overload. So have resources able to come back and look at later on. So I like either creating either, I, I personally do all the creations myself for my courses, just because I, I like having that control. So how to install Anaconda, how to open Jupyter Notebooks, how to run a Jupyter Notebook. And then that way they have something they can always refer to later on in class. Always, always, always so test your code prior to releasing it. You don't want to just kind of release it and then have some bugs in there and that's going to create issues later on. Also start with like a hello world assignment or something that's low stakes. It's like a low stake walkthrough where they just have to open up a file, make a couple of changes and save it. And then that's it. And then you're really kind of making that stepping stone to more complex things, making sure they feel comfortable with this. I also like creating like a FAQ, a wiki page on Canvas, or if you're using Blackboard, whatever LMS you're using, um, that you use as Canvas. So I always recommend having like a wiki, so that way students can help each other with learning and helping debug things. Because that's part of it is like kind of knowing where to look for, for things, where to look for, for information, where to look for help. Yeah. It also builds up that community too, so they can then they're like, okay, well, I can help others. I know how to fix this. And let me help them out. And then someone else helps them back out in the future. So really building up that is really important. So where to download Anaconda distribution. Let me go ahead and I'm going to shift this over. Here's the link. And just because we have a limited time, I'm not going to download it. But I'm going to go ahead and show you. <laughs> so nice thing with Anaconda is it's, it's a free distribution. It has everything you need. I mean, you could do something that's a little bit lower, like, um, let's see, there's different variations of Python you can use as well. This is I like because it has everything you need. You can actually skip registration and then just download what you need. So if you're using Windows, I do Windows, Linux, or Mac, and so forth, and just go from there. Once you've downloaded it, Jupyter Notebook is already installed with it and has everything really you need, so you don't have to install additional stuff. That's a really nice thing. <clears throat> so in a few minutes, I'm going to open up a couple of different files. We're going to talk through it for some quick demoing. And I want to make sure there's also time for questions and answers. So what I have found helpful, and actually, let me take a step back. Um, just more generally speaking about quantitative methods, what I found helpful is kind of really setting up the stage for the class and just saying that the reasons why it's important. And like I struggled at first with statistics in that class and I mentioned that and I own that. And then say that it's really, it's part of the process of learning it. I'm not expecting everyone to remember everything. It's, it's gonna be a process and that these are going to be real life skills that you're going to have, like whether it's Excel, Python, R, what's the benefit for that? And to really kind of think through, like trying to break that mentality of, well, I'm not good at math, or it's going to be difficult. And kind of really breaking down to smaller bits to work off of. Um, that's why I found helpful when I taught the quantitative methods for undergrads over in the psych department. 
um, highly recommend kind of breaking that down a bit. And there's actually, um, we're doing the faculty spotlight for quantitative methods in the next couple of weeks. So it'll be a new page on the CTR webpage. Um, and it's going to have information from different instructors who teach research methods, whether it's quant, qual, or mixed, in their recommendations. So this was actually recommendations I got from Dr. Nate Hur over in the psychology department. And I really liked his lens of how he framed things. And I do that with all my courses now. It's kind of just really breaking that cycle and making it so it's just try and make sure that they're able to really feel like they can own the material, that these are skill sets they can use and help. Um, so for setting up homework assignments, what I like to do is um, you can, this is what I found that works for me. I create a template. So when I'm doing like a homework assignment or a class assignment, I have a boilerplate. So it has some of the code, but it's missing parts and they have to fill it in. So students have to fill in some of their own code and run it. There's also areas where they need to type in their own results and interpret them. And then they can submit the code or the PDF and kind of knitting it for submission. And then that way, they, they kind of, they're given a template and get to practice it. And I always recommend, like, within my classes, they can work together on it, but they just all have to submit their own assignment. Because that way they can kind of talk with each other, like, oh, I'm getting this error, and really help each other out to really learn it. Because my focus is just kind of learning the language and feeling comfortable with the tool. And that's what I found that's helpful. Um, so what I actually do is I'm going to open up a class assignment and a tutorial. We're going to kind of talk through that. Uh, but before I do that, I want to check in. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Um, feel free if you have questions, um, go ahead and unmute or raise your hand or put it in the chat. And we'll go from there. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and open up Jupyter Notebook, and we'll kind of talk through this now. So there's a bunch of files in there. I'm going to go ahead and I'll paste this again here as well. It's just a link to all the materials. And since I already have Anaconda installed, I'm going to go ahead and go to All Apps. It might look a little bit different on a Mac or a Linux. I'm going to open up Anaconda 3, and I'm going to just find Jupyter Notebook. And let's give that a second. And if you see this, this is perfectly normal. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and close these down. Okay. So this is Jupyter Notebook. <laughs> it's um, a browser-based IDE. And now I can go ahead, and the big thing is trying to figure out, okay, well, where are we? Right now, I'm in just the default folder in my user profile. So the biggest thing is I like to have a video and kind of just walk through, okay, well, where do I go from here? How do I find my files? So that's going to be the biggest hurdle first. So I have stuff on my desktop right now. If I go ahead and move this, I mean, minimize. You don't want to close this down because if you close this down, that's going to close the system down too. So I have, let me drag this over. I have a local copy of all the materials. So I just want to get into this folder to get to my Jupyter Notebook that I already have. So I want to go to Desktop. Here's my AFW folder. And uh, let's start with the teaching example first. So go ahead and open up that and I have a new tab here. So what I like to do is I like to, whenever I'm teaching with this, I like to heavily annotate. So I like to make sure that there's information here. So whenever we can also add like a cell. So if you've used Drupal or notebooks, it's great. You can actually go ahead and create a new cell. It's going to default to code. So if I do like x equals 5, print x. And if I go ahead and run that, well, it's x, or it's 5. So you want to make sure you do things in sequence. But I like to annotate both using, because uh, right now it's in a markdown. 
So with a markdown is we can also then create things like equations later on too. But the big thing is because if you try to put like comments or annotations with it being in a code and try to run that, it's going to give an error message. So the big thing is going to be showing, okay, how do I create a new cell? And then how, if I need to make an annotation, how do I make that so it's a markdown instead of a code? So I like to put both annotations within the cell as well as outside the cell, kind of breaking down it further, for it, especially if it's complex code. So now I'm just installing some stuff. And this is a really basic one. This is actually um, a new video series I'll be adding to the on-demand um, website for software in probably the next couple of weeks. This is like an introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. So it's all of the code, you know, those corresponding video as well. But kind of, <laughs> it breaks down the specific code in kind of a, it's more like how to apply this and how to do some coding stuff like dictionaries and regression and import data sets. So just making sure it's heavily annotated. And then I would like to do is kind of walk through it line by line and explain it and have it be really linear. That way, if I'm, because if I'm jumping around, if I try to run this right now, Go ahead and this, and then try to, okay, run that code. Well, error message. Well, that's because I haven't loaded the data frame in. So, I mean, if you can make it as annotated as possible, that way, as I begin all the information in there of how to run the code, how to interpret the results. So, I typically, when I teach, I actually don't use slides. I'll just use, like, have open up R script, open up a Python script, and just talk through that that's heavily annotated. That way, it's they're not having to balance slides with code and go back and forth. So I didn't do that for this one, <laughs> but kind of the idea. Now, what I really want to show is like what a, a boilerplate homework example would look like here. And actually, I'm going to go ahead, before I do that, I'm going to put a new notebook. So I'm going to go into my main Jupyter Notebook page, go to New and Notebook. So by default, we we'll make sure we have a Python 3 kernel. We'll go ahead and select that. So this is untitled. So I'm going to call this my super awesome script. And then I can go ahead and I can start writing it. And I'd probably start with first creating a couple of additional cells. This is my Awesome script and go forth from there. So that's how you get started just with a basic Jupyter notebook. Now with this one, this is one that I actually created as an example of a homework assignment. So this is going to be for regression. The student would then go into the different markdown cells, type in their name. And then they can put in the date. And I provide some information where they already have to like import the different uh, modules here. So you want to go ahead and run that. The nice thing with Jupyter Notebook is equations like this makes it super easy. Because this is the equation that if I go ahead and run it, nice and formatted. So I walk through, because I have to have the data set here. I go back to my home directory. There's the HS data set. Again, having everything in a bin, I find that to be most helpful. And then we can go ahead and start running lines of code. And so I ask them to then run a regression and store it as an object called LM1. So I would probably get rid of this. And where they, you know, just leave them in the template of just like, okay, well, now they have to write the regression line. And that's what we'd be expecting. This was complete. That way you can kind of see a complete one, but I'd start like removing some stuff here and there. That way they get practice. Then we have the summary, of all the information, and then they have to fill in this markdown of what the R squared for the omnibus model was. So I'd ask them, so they'd have to scroll up to the results, find the R squared, and report that. Report the F statistic and the degrees of freedom. That way they're learning and reporting like how to get the information of well, was this an overall statistically significant regression? Also, the omnibus p-value. I don't like p-values. I'm more of the Bayesian method, methodology type area, but you got to report them. 
and I'll take fit from the um the Bruce Thompson school of thought. So I have this uh, little GM on the handout of well, do I have anything? So they'd have I'd ask them, okay, well, right, big picture, what did you find? And then because I'm within kind of that more edsec framework, I'd ask them to interpret the coefficients, the beta weights and structure coefficients, the squared ones, for each of the different variables here. So you didn't have to write down, well, what was the coefficient? What was the structure coefficient? And then they'd have to retype this coefficient. So changing out the coefficients with the actual numbers to retype it. And then I'd ask them, okay, well, I'd probably omit this. And just ask them, well, give me a white hat score. So if we have a male participant, age is 14, this is their score for X for word meaning. Cube score was 6.5. Two five, well, what was the predicted visual perception if that's our outcome? So we'd have to then take the equation, a bug, and kind of copy and paste it, the coefficients in there, and then print out what this would be. So I'm asking them to then predict someone's score based on that information. And then type it out here too. Even though they have a print one for the Y hat, again, this is just a markdown. But then that way, it's all nice and formatted. And I do like to include this information of like the date and time. That way I have a, it's nice and time stamped as well. So they could then submit this completed one just to the Jupyter Notebook file. But I always recommend, let me go ahead and just, let's see. It's going to go ahead and just run everything. Because again, I was skipping around without running stuff, which isn't good. Oop, I went too far. We get rid of these extra cells. So what I like to do then is, okay, well, for turning it in, they can also then save notebook as, actually, no, my apologies. It's going to be save and export. I like doing it as a PDF. So we'll give that a few minutes. And so right now it's actually knitting it. So it's gonna have this nice formatted equations and all that good stuff. And then you could actually just submit the code and then the PDF, I could still put the PDF or have that submitted in the canvas and just create it accordingly. Nope, oh, there we go. And so this is what the completed assignment looks like. So you have the information that I filled out. We have the equations. I have all the code that the student had to write in and all the results in there. So I can then just double check because if I'm using like randomized data or simulation data for the assignment and set the seed, I have all the stuff I need to hear. Make sure that I'm able to understand or see that they're understanding the results and the coding here. And then the date time as well. And they can just upload this into Canvas and then that's it. But everything, so I don't necessarily have to run their code because everything is in here that I would need. It just takes a little bit of time to set it up. But this is what I found that kind of giving that boilerplate code and that template and then having them use that, I found that to be helpful in what works. And then they can start making their own ones as well. Let's see. So let me switch back over to the slides. Oops, way too far on that. Sorry about that. Uh, so some resources. Uh, so in the near future, the CTO On Demand page is going to be an intro to Jupyter Notebooks and Python, as well as Spider as well. Um, if you're getting started too, I always recommend, and I actually purposely, sometimes not purposefully, sometimes it is on purpose, I will, when I'm teaching, I will have a brain problem like, oh, how do I run this in Python? And then just open up a, a browser and just type in how to run a regression in Python or in R. And that's going to be a big benefit for open source. There's tons of great tutorials out there, lots of great information. It's just like, how do you look for it? If you're interested in like talking through with teaching with R or Python, send me an email. Always happy to chat through that. Um, I do want to mention, though, CTL does not provide course support. So please, please, please 
Uh, don't send your students with the expectation that wouldn't be helping them troubleshoot issues or teach them how to use the software. So not able to do that. But I also want to mention, if, if you have any questions, uh, let's go have a Q&A time. And if you also want to book a consultation with me, uh, here's the link. Just make sure you select uh, quantitative slash computational. Also, if you're interested in the high-performance computer, I'm one of the liaisons for that. And it's new, it's shiny, and it's just got it deployed. And it has Python on it as well. I love talking about coding, so just please, please feel free to reach out to me and love to chat more. So uh, let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, and by all means, please, please, please take any and all information that I provided. Take it adapt it, run with it. I'm a big proponent of open coding, open data. So please feel free to adapt it. You, you don't need my permission or anything like that. Just, just go for it. Uh, but let me know if you have any questions. Oh, good. That was helpful. Uh, and if these materials are specific analyses that you're interested in, I'm always happy to do some research, send out and look, send, and look for code or write something up. So always happy to do that too, if that'd be of help. Uh, just reach out to me. Hey, I'm just gonna uh, share the screen if that's okay. Okay, cool. Okay. okay. Here's the QR code for the survey. I also dropped the link to the chat so you can just click on the link if you want. And thank you all so much for attending. And please feel free to reach out to me. I love talking about coding. I love talking about statistics and research. It, it's why I do what I do. So always happy to, to chat. And just hope that the rest of the AFW sessions are going well for you. And um, please also stick around for the plenary that's going to be starting, I believe, at uh, noon as well later on, too. Yeah.